Hi everyone, you're listening to Bookworms being broadcast to you today on Arrow 92.7 FM, your community access radio channel, and Wireapper TV on Freeview Channel 41. This programme is broadcast live every other Tuesday at 3pm and repeated on the Tuesdays in between at 3pm. Now, over the course of the next 30 minutes, we'll read you some literary items, or not, uh, that we've in... <laughs> that we've enjoyed reading recently um or not recently which we hope you'll find interesting so i hope that's piqued your interest my name is steve lilliston and today i've got with me graham bernard hi steve hi graham how you doing good 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 you're a bit nervous about my uh, contribution but that's all, all will be revealed you're nervous <laughs> okay you <are. laughs> graham's made me very nervous about what he's going to do but that's okay i'm sure mm. it's going to be wonderful I'm not going to say anything more, apart from I hope you enjoy the, the next 30 minutes, and I'm going to hand straight over to Graham. Thank you, Stephen. So, yes, I have kept you on tenterhooks over the last few days, um, trying to decide what I was going to read, and then I told you, of course, that I'm going to read something a little bit controversial, and that got the old heart going and put you in hospital overnight uh, to have some surgery because you were worried about what I was reading. <laughs> Um, I've got about three books on the go at the moment, but what I'm going to read today is something that everybody's read. It's a very common book, um, and I've actually disguised it. I've got sitting here the New Zealand House and Garden, which is I've bought in purely to disguise this from, from what I've got. Um, but so what I'm reading from today, actually, Steve, is the um, Warapa phone book. So um, here we go. And uh, I've actually never really looked at the phone book before. I, I get it in the mailbox and it goes into the drawer and I don't worry about it until I need to find somebody's phone number. But the other day I was looking for somebody to do some stained glass uh, repairs. And I went online and I thought, what am I going to do to get this thing fixed? And when I bought it up online, it was very complicated, hard to find somebody who was uh, doing stained glass repairs and I just didn't know what to do so I thought well, I'd look in the phone book and uh, I was absolutely surprised about what is in the phone book and um, so I started to look through from the front cover and was surprised and intrigued about what information is in our phone book so that's what I'm going to be talking about today and I'm going to quote a few things out of here. So there's no bad language, it's suitable for all ages, and it's a jolly good read. So so you are quite serious about reading from the phone book? I then? am. You know, um, okay. I know people do it in prison because that's all they've got to read, but um, <laughs> I'm not. It, I, I, I know I'm being a bit flippant. I, I'll just stop you for a second there, Graham, and I'll apologise to our, our viewers. I'm afraid you're focusing on me at the moment. Something seems to have gone wrong with the cameras and we are not focusing on you, but you're probably quite happy oh, well, about very, that. I'm very happy about that. So, yeah. if you like, I'll just make funny faces at it's you. It's called upstaging, <laughs> isn't it, I think? Something like that. Yes, that's Sorry. Right. I'm used to that from you. Right. Um, so, I just started to look through the phone book and I was quite surprised about what was in it. Uh, as All I right. said before when you went here, um, it's normally just sits in the drawer. Um, and I've struggled to find things online when I'm looking in the yellow pages. Yeah. Uh, it's very complicated to try and find something simple. You get all these pages and pages of websites, but it doesn't actually take you to where you want to go. It takes you through other websites. Looking for a hotel, for instance, if you type in Copthorne Wire Wrapper, you're not going to go straight to the Copthorne Wire Wrapper website. It's through all sorts of other agencies and different routes and things. Right. Whereas if you go to the phone book, it's straight there. If you want to find a, a plumber, you go to the plumber in the phone book and they're all listed there with their ads, their phone numbers, their websites, and all all listed. Very, very easy. Well, Much easier than going online. Like yellow pages. Yeah. And I carry them. Okay. Carry one of these in the car. It's really handy because you don't always get phone signal when you're in the car. The first thing I noticed about this was that you can earn flybys by spreading um, word about organisations that you've met and used on um, through the yellow pages so if you found a company in the yellow pages that you wanted to use and you're happy with them you can then go to a special website through yellow pages and do a review on them and if that review is accepted then uh, you earn flybys oh really yeah, okay so, so, oh, good so that's really good oh. the other thing i had here was um 
list of personal help services. Now, if you wanted to uh, call uh, the AIDS hotline or you wanted uh, Lifeline or the Open Home Foundation, there's a huge list of organisations that are listed in the phone book that I didn't know about. If you wanted to be a blood donor, who would you ring? There's actually a special number to ring to right. talk about blood donor. Right. Um, Barnados. I mean, where would you go to ring Barnados? If you wanted to uh, ring someone and report cattle on the on the railway tracks, you've mm. seen cows wandering down the down the tracks. Who would you ring? There's a phone number in here for for railways. For wayward cattle. Yeah. So <laughs> I mean, if you rang the council or you rang the police. They probably wouldn't be able to get that message on because by the time you've spoken to the police, the cows have been hit by the train. Right. Um, there's even support. There's a support group for people affected by cleft lip, and uh, they've got a special number in the phone book. So if you happen to have the affliction of a cleft palate, cleft palate. there's a there's a support group for you in the in the phone book. <laughs> I told you it was going to be interesting. So it's under it's under cleft palate, is it? Or? It's, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Cleft support. It's called cleft support. <laughs> Um, the other thing which I found really interesting was that there are over 40 um, postcodes between Masterton and Lake Ferry, and that surprised me. Yeah, um, yeah. I thought there might be 10, 15, 20, but there's actually 40. Uh, so it's quite a big area, of course, from here down to Lake Ferry. Right. I, I found that really interesting. Yeah, yeah. There's some really good maps in the in the phone book. Another another really good thing when you're looking up. The, the Macs, you know, the McDonald's and the McFees, and you go up and down the pages trying to find whether it's Mac or Mick or whatever. Actually, in the front of the M's, there's a little message which I'd like to read, um, and it tells you all about it. It says, in determining alphabetical order, the prefixes M, Mac, and Mick are all treated as Mac, and the next letter in the name determines the position of the entry. Similarly, the names such as Mace... After the C. Mac, yeah, Mackin, Mackin, M-A-C-H-I-N, M-A-C-K-I-N, are included in the above listings. And the fourth letter of such surnames determines their position. So if you read that at the beginning, you'd be able to go straight to the name you're looking for. Whereas right. I've spent ages going up and down, up and down. That actually makes sense, because sometimes the, the name is misspelt. Yeah. And, and, or you've been given the, the wrong spelling of the name. Yeah. Another good. thing I found really interesting was the difference between unlisted numbers and restricted numbers. I didn't know there was a difference. No. Um, so if you wanted an, a number that was not listed, it wouldn't appear in the white pages and it wouldn't appear on the um, uh, listings in the white pages online. Right. But if you um, rang 018 and said, could you please give me the phone number of Graham Bernard, who lives in Gladstone, they would give it to them. Because it's not restricted, it's just unlisted. Okay. Um, oh, really? But, and if they said, can you give me his address, please? They would say, no, I can't. But if they said, is his address 123 High Street? They would say, yes, it is. So if the person asking wants to know the address you have they have to know it yeah to have it confirmed they won't be given it and by the way my address is not 123 high street if anyone thinks mm. that's where i live <laughs> um that's uh, that's interesting because i thought that was the whole point of having a an unlisted that's the number yeah number. so uh, and nobody could get hold of it then you go to a restricted number so the restricted number this means your name address and number will not be included in the white pages residential book or in the white pages online and will not be given out by 018 directory assistance. However, in the case of an emergency, that number will be shown. So if you rang the police or ambulance or fire, they would get that phone number. Right. And if a collect call was made from that number, that would show up on the um, the account of the person who had, re had approved the call. Right. So if I was ringing you collect uh, from a restricted number, when you got your phone bill, there would be that number shown. Right. Right. Okay. So there's quite a big difference between not list between uh, having a not listed number, unlisted number, and a restricted. So yeah, if you yeah. think, oh, I'm not in the phone book, no one's going to know me, which I was up until last year. I'm in the phone book for the first time this year. Hmm. Um, I've always been unlisted, 
And I don't think people have ever thought, oh, well, if it's not in the phone book, I can't ring right. and uh, get it from them, but you can. But you've made a specific point of being unlisted, have you? Yep. Oh, okay. Because yeah. I've, I've never had a landline until now. Right. Mm, I've got a landline now just for internet, so that's the only reason I've got it. Right. And also, that's not true, actually. Also, where we live, we don't get cell phone coverage. So we've had to have a landline put in. So that's, right. the, that's why I'm in f- for the first time. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, I mean... I know I'm, I'm being a bit flippant talking about the phone book, but it's actually quite interesting what's in it. Mm. And then, if you're really interested, you could try and memorise all the names and addresses and phone numbers in there. Uh, but I haven't done that yet. <laughs> I have got more interesting things to read. But I must say that I'm really impressed with how easy it is to use the yellow pages of a phone book, which I haven't done very often because I've just gone online to try and find a yeah, plumber or an that's electrician. That's what I've always done, just Google and it. And this mm. is so much easier. Yeah. Um, but so it's re- it's really um, gone out of fashion, hasn't it? I mean, people. Well, look at the size of fewer it. Fewer and fewer. Pe- yeah, that's right. It used to be massive, didn't yeah. it? Mm. And more and more people are now having, are not having um, landline numbers. They're just relying s- um, solely on their cell phone numbers, which we've done for many years until we've moved out into a, an area where we can't get a right. cell phone right. coverage. Right. I don't particularly like having. I don't like telephones. I don't like using telephones. Um, and this is the only place I advertise my celebrancy work is in the yellow pages, but it's just one line. I'm not really quite sure whether I pick up any work from it, but right. um, it's, a re- it's a reasonable cost for a year. So, uh, yeah, that's the Wire phone book. Um, a good read? Is That's the white and the yellow pages. White and yellow. Yeah, so yeah. the yellow is actually twice the size of the white now. Is that? The white's getting... Look how small that is. God, yeah. And that's, that's covering Lake Ferry right up to Payatua. So it's, that's quite a big area. Well, it's about 50,000... No, it's 50,000 people, I suppose. Yeah. There's another... Um, I mentioned the Max, how, you know, how... And there's another There's another surname which is really hard to find. Oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, no, it's not the O's, but okay. uh, that's also um, got an explanation at the beginning of that letter. I can't remember what it is now. Um, oh. Oh, oh, it isn't. Um, no. Uh, so that makes it much easier. Well, it seems like Smith and Smythe. I mean, would they yeah. Well, that's not quite so hard. There was mm. just another letter, and I can't think what it was now, but it doesn't oh, matter. Okay. Um, so there you go. Well, I'd like to say fascinating, but that would be an yeah. absolute lie. <laughs> well, interesting though. We have um, the criteria for the show was fairly open. Yes. Um, and it wasn't necessarily stuff that we liked, but I just found that interesting. And the books I'm reading at the moment aren't really books that I would want to talk about on here. No, that's fine. So that's, fine. that's why I picked this up for a purpose and mm. thought, oh. Um, and I started marking things in there. So. No, there it isn't, that is interesting. I mean, the whole point of the programme, I think, I think, is that everybody has has a different interest. Um, and, it, and it's all about the written word and the different yeah. forms that it takes. So, But the reason I really did it today was because I thought if one person hears this and thinks, oh, I didn't know that, that's good, then I've achieved something because there's right. quite important stuff in the phone book. And yeah. I think we should be making ourselves familiar with it. I didn't know I could ring someone if I saw a cow on the railway tracks. No. Um, <laughs> or if someone got there's, – there's a poison number, you know, if, you, if someone's dealing with poisons right. and there's an accident, there's a special poisons hotline. Um, so that's in there. Otherwise, what would you do? You'd be thinking, oh, who do I call? Who do I call? You're yeah. Call them 111. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's right. So there we are. So um, thank you, Graham. All yours. That was fascinating. I hope you've got something um, <laughs> uh, that's of a, a sharp contrast. Absolute contrast. Couldn't be further <laughs> Couldn't be further from that. But but thank you for, for that. It was really... It won't was, be as well read as mine, probably. That was actually quite interesting. <laughs> um, yes. Okay. Well, my bit is, as Graham says, totally different. I'm going to read um, a small excerpt from some a, a piece of work by Norrie Epstein. Um, so Norrie Epstein is, um, has lectured extensively in the University of California as well as the University of Rochester, covering almost every literary figure. And she is currently Professor of Liberal Arts at the Mass- Massachusetts College of Art and Design. She's only ever, it's a she, She's only ever written two books, The Friendly Shakespeare and The Friendly Dickens. Friendly Shakespeare in 93 and The Friendly Dickens in 98. So she was commissioned to write those. It's a series of books, The Friendly 
whatever, um, and she's done two of them. Um, she has co-authored two other books. I've no idea why she's never written any other books, because she writes really well. But these are very different. These are essentially biographies of Shakespeare and Dickens, but written in a very different or friendly format. Um, and the thing I love about it is you can pick, a, pick the book up at virtually and, and turn to any page at random and begin reading. And it's full of little interesting chunks. One review of The Friendly Dickens said, this is not a full-scale biographical or scholarly study of the author's life and works. For that, one should consult works by Edgar Johnson, Fred Kaplan, blah, blah, blah. Instead, Epstein wants to, or Epstein, wants to wet, wet the average reader's interest in Dickens by reviewing all aspects of his life and by summarising each of his published novels. Epstein successfully uses illustrations, sidebars, lists and interviews with actors, critics and various Dickensians to make her observations and critical readings entertain to the non-scholarly reader. So, um, for, the, for those of you on YTV, this is the, this is the book, Nori Epstein's The Friendly Dickens, and for those of you on Arrow 92.7 FM, you'll just have to take my word for it, what a splendid book it is. At random, as I did at home the other day, I went to a page at random, so I'm going to read from it. This talks about Dickens' life and the fact that he led a double life. So, to fully understand Dickens' final years, one must see Nellie Ternan standing in the shadows. Nellie Ternan was a famous actress in those days. His relationship with her forced him to become an escape artist, and it's because of her that the last 13 years of his life are filled with periods in which they both seem to disappear. Not even their letters survive. In 1860, Nellie Ternan retired from the theatre and figuratively went underground. After Dickens' death in 1870, she re-emerged and her life assumed a traceable, normal course. Yet 13 years had been completely erased. Her biographer, Claire Tomlin, declares that Nellie was someone who almost wasn't there, who vanished into thin air. Her names, dates, family and experiences very nearly disappeared from the record for good. Through the work of scholars and literary detectives, Nellie Ternan has been partially rescued from obscurity. After his marital separation in 1858, Dickens' life branches into three divergent paths, the public, the private and the secret. His relationship with Nellie was conducted through codes, aliases and trusted third parties. The rate book, or rent book, for her cottage in Slough in the UK reveals that the rent was variously paid by Francis Turnham, Thomas Turnham, Thomas Tringham and Charles Tringham. Dickens never kept an alias for very long. During this time he was putting money into what he elliptically referred to as the N Trust. Given his taste for the dramatic, one suspects that Dickens enjoyed such sub-rosa activities. Before leaving for America in 1868, he devised a code to indicate whether Nelly should join him. Upon his arrival, he would send his manager a telegram that would have a special meaning for Nelly. That special meaning remained hidden until scholar sleuth Ada Nisbet cracked a cryptic memo in the pocket diary Dickens lost. And the code he used was, he would use a phrase like, uh, all means, all well, sorry, all well means you come. Safe and well means you don't come. Upon arriving in America, Dickens wired, sent a wire, a telegram, saying, safe and well, expect letter full of good hope. <laughs> Nelly remained with her sister in Italy. When Dickens returned, he did not, as reported, immediately rush to Gads Hill, where he used to live, for a festive homecoming, but returned discreetly to Nellie's cottage, 
where they had two days of undisturbed, undisturbed calm. Two days later, he officially returned home with no one the wiser. So he was, he was quite a character, um, played a lot of games, but he was a player as well, um, with, with Nelly Turnan, obviously. Was he well known in his day? Like, was he famous author in his day? Oh, absolutely. He was. Yeah. I mean, and, uh, and in the US as well. He, he, uh, he did trips to the US. I think he did two big trips to the US. Really? Went touring around, and reading was his thing. He would read excerpts, and they would pay him to go there and read excerpts from his, um, from his what do you call them, episodes. They were like little chapters. He'd do them a chapter at a time. Right. And sell a chapter at a time. Um, so yes, he he was big, um, and probably made a lot of money doing that. And he made a lot of money. Yes, he did very nicely. He was the one that started up the idea of copyright. Um, oh. Wanted to copyright his works, and it didn't get very far, but it sowed the seed, I think. And from there, uh, they came out with copyright laws, and people could earn money by coining works and things. Which he never did. I mean, he, he earned money, but but not from a copyright point of view. Um, something else, again, just at random, but I, I picked up, this is, I found this fascinating. So this is, this little chapter is called Bonfire of the Vanities. So as the most famous and popular writer of the age, Dickens knew that practically every chance word he uttered and every scrap of paper he wrote upon would be scrutinised posthumously and that death alone would be victorious over his love of control and order. But not completely. He could apply in advance some measure of damage control. To that end, he took an irrevocable step that, made every, that makes every Dickensian wince. On a crisp fall day, that's, that's autumn, in 1860... Three years after beginning his liaison with Nellie Turnham and ten years before his death, Dickens, Charles Dickens, went into his backyard in Gads Hill, built an enormous bonfire and tossed every personal letter he had ever received into the flames. As his sons Henry and Plorn carted out one stuffed basket under, after another, he cast the accumulated letters and papers of twenty years into his epistolary pyre. His daughter, Mamie, begged him to salvage the letters from, from the more eminent correspondence, but Dickens, according to his biographer, was mercilessly indiscriminate, absolutely insistent. Letters, Dickens informed Mamie, were written in the heat of the moment, and it is fitting that these unguarded, heated moments should be destroyed by fire. Fire, the Victorian paper shredder was the only way Dickens had of mitigating history's judgment. While the letters burned, the father and three children sat down and with Neronian indifference, as in Nero, roasted onions on the ashes of the grate. <laughs> Suddenly the sky darkened and a heavy rain soon doused the fire, turning the letters into a sodden pulp. With wry solemnity, Dickens remarked, I suspect my correspondence of having overcast the face of the heavens. He never regretted the action. Would to God every letter I had ever written was on that pile. His bonfire of vanity would become an annual rite of fall. I mean, it's just, just a lovely little chunk, a little look into the history uh, of Dickens. And, and it's full. This book is full of little bits and pieces like that. Probably... Those little stories you wouldn't find in a normal biography about, and they'd be skipped over. So this is the more intimate, yes, little bits. Yes, exactly right. Brings it alive. If you read, I don't know if you've ever read a biography of Dickens. I've read a couple, um, and it gets very dry after a while. Mm. Um, and that's what I love about this: that you can just, as I say, you can pick it up at random, read a little bit, and put it down again. And it's a fabulous book to have on hand sort of between books. And the, the friendly Shakespeare is, is the same. Yeah, I'll even if you take even, your word for that. <laughs> even if you don't like Shakespeare. I um, um uh you funny you say about sitting there cooking onions while watching the fire burn when this is a silly story but it reminded me when we were kids living on the farm I mean, my father had a cow that he had to um, kill or it died. 
rather right. than bury the thing, you burn it because it was just too big a hole to dig. You never had the digging machinery, so he used to burn these cows. Mum used to wrap up oh. potatoes in tinfoil for us kids and we'd sit around this burning cow with these potatoes <laughs> in the fire. Oh my um, God. But there used to be a man living in Masterton called Beecham Dickens, and he was a relative of oh, Charles really? Dickens, and um, he's died a few years ago, but his wife still lives here, oh, and really? she's a lovely friend of my wife and I, and um, yeah, so... Uh, and it's interesting, I asked you that question about his fame, and that's you read about him saying about his fame. Mm, mm. Yes, he was incredibly popular at the time. As I say, he used to write, you probably know, but I don't know how many of their read, our, our uh, viewers know, but the, Dickens wrote his books in chapters. I forget what they called them, but the, the little chapters, and he would sell them um, one at a time, one every week or month, I forget, the periodicity. But you would buy one and it would you know, be a sort of a cliffhanger and you'd be waiting for the next one. Um, sort of like a periodical in a way, I suppose. It would have, yeah. Something like that. I, I guess so, yeah. Well, it's, I, it reminds me of the old um, Saturday morning pictures when you yeah. go and see Tarzan and they'd be hanging off a cliff, you know, and you'd have to go <laughs> next week to yes. see what Well, it's a bit like watching Close to Home. Um, True. <laughs> We, I did a concert a few years ago. We did uh, the music of Charles Dickens. Um, oh, right. It was a fundraiser for one of the churches in Martinborough, and I wrote the script for it, and it was all to do with the music that was p popular around Dickens' time. At that time. And I think some music that was mentioned in some of his stories. Uh, and we had four, five so um, musicians, three of them from the NZSO, uh, and they, so I would talk about the music and the, the relation of that music to, to Dickens, and then they would play the piece. Right. It was a lovely, lovely concert. And I've oh, often wondered whether we shouldn't have done it up here as well. Yeah. And did it in Martinborough. Yeah. But it's sort of a, um, it's a period of time, Dickens. It's Dickensian. I mean, there's a bookshop just opened in um, Featherston, and it's called the Dickensian. Oh, was it? I haven't yeah. seen that. Uh, oh, really? It's opened by a colleague of my wife and I's. Um, and, uh, it's very Dickensian to look at inside. Yeah. It's very oldie weldy with little windows and wooden floors. And really? It's quite charming. Really? It's called the Dickensian. Yeah. He's a fascinating character, and, and of course, it's, uh, he has an incredible following. Uh, Miriam Margolis. Oh, yeah. Do you know the character? Margulies. Margulies, I beg your pardon. Um, yeah. And she's an absolute nutter when it comes to Dickens. <laughs> well, and she's got a. She's a, a nutter full stop. Well, she's a nutter full stop. <laughs> but she has a show that she goes on um, tour with talking about Dickens. Well, the women's women of Dickens, I think. Didn't she play the women of Dickens? Yes, the women of Dickens, yeah. yeah right. Yeah. So uh, fascinating. But in America, there's a huge following in America. Mm. Um, he yeah. doesn't feature in this. No, no, I didn't see anything in there under Dickens. Dickens, so. there should be a Dickens in yeah, this. Yeah, so I'm going <laughs> to write the yellow pages and say. <laughs> Can you put a Dickens section in, please? Indeed, indeed. Oh, that's good. That's very interesting. Yeah. And that's the sort of book you just pick up, as you say, yeah, and read a couple of pages and put it down and you don't lose the thread. Yeah, that's right. And nice little chunks. And there's always something interesting. I've read it. I've had it for 25 years, um, both books, and I still pick it up and, and I'll read little bits. And I thought, oh, I didn't know that, um, which, is, which is fascinating. So that's the Friendly Dickens. Nori Epstein, um, and she's also written The Friendly Shakespeare, and they're the only two books she's ever written, but they're wonderful books. And Graham, we had a, a nice dissertation on the um, Yellow Pages. And you know, we, you and I met 30 or 5 odd years ago on a Dickensian show. That's true, that's true. On stage, Oliver. <laughs> Oliver, I played um, Bill Sykes, and you were the... I was the knife grinder. The knife grinder, yeah. <laughs> Wellington well, Hospital Repertory. That's right. Yeah, long time ago. Great Indeed. stuff, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, and thank you, everybody. I think that's all we've got time for today. So thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed that. Tune in again next Thursday at three o'clock. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Cheerio.